shower in the place and I was using that for one, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. Well, 14 years ago, coming up to 55 now, and I took a huge adventure, a huge step in life, and I thought, well, I shall write a book about it. I've, I've partially finished that book anyway and need to readjust. But rather than do a year in Provence, I'll do my eight years in Aveyron, and I went across to France. So with my disabilities, with my problems and so on, I decided to have well, a major adventure in life and move from the East Yorkshire coast, coziness, security, and take a place over in France. I was looking all round abroad at the time, I was looking at Portugal, I was looking at Spain and all sorts of things, but decided in the end this rather lovely place in France which needed total renovation. I found a dance hall, cafe, restaurant and bar that was in a very dilapidated condition but um, also was in a beautiful position. It was a prime position that took my fancy. There were many places I could have bought in France at the time, but I just stood on the banks of this place on my own and thought, I don't feel alone here. I shan't be alone here. This seems all right. I shall be okay. And the place was called Le Paradou, in French, the little paradise. Um, and that's what it became for me over those years, although at first it was very, very hard indeed. And as I say, struggling on my own and with my own physical problems, it was certainly an adventure. And if you're interested, and for those of you that do like to look at other people's lives and share them, I thought I might share this with you. I thought you might enjoy this, to see how I built up. La merde, in other words the shit, and the good times as well. So from the beginning of very harsh winters, living in a, an open hall with just wood panels, with gaps in between the walls, wind coming through, huddling round a little paraffin fire, um, taking three or four hot water bottles to bed just to survive, to keep warm overnight, um, snow all around the place and so on, ice, through rebuilding the whole place, tearing walls down, dealing with rogue French agents, dealing with rogue French electricians and so on who sabotaged the places they went on, learning the language to just get by, which is what I can do now, and then building up this wonderful place and let's visit all around the country as well. Let's go around Aviron, but let's also go across to the Camargue, and other places in France and see this wonderful um, life that I led and uh, the adventures that I had, if you wish. It's a long film, it will be done in different parts and I'll do my best to share it with you before you see the book if you like, a prelude. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed those times, the ups and the downs, they were wonderful adventures. But having said that, my life may be changing again, so I think I'm tempted to go back to France again, we shall see, this is a whole new adventure. So, in other words, watch this space, because um, in time to come, it may well be that having had this six years or so in Lincolnshire, and we've got the films on YouTube already here about how I built the house here and the gardens here, I may now um, be moving from here back across to France and spending time backwards and forwards whilst I still have just enough health and mobility to do so. In other words, a last large adventure in life before I have to settle back and put the carpet slippers on and watch TV and drink beer. But until then, I'll do what I can with what I can and continue my adventures and my paintings and so on and share everything with you if you wish. Okay then, here we go and let's take a trip across to the Aveyron, the massive central, not far from Rhodes, about 30 miles from Rhodes, and uh, the beautiful little village of Astang which in fact Giscard d'Estaing purchased the chateau, the castle there, even though he actually purchased the title as well, with the river lot running down the gorge du lot, um, wonderful cascading river. Where I was though, where I purchased, it was barraged or dammed just a bit further down, so I had a beautiful lake right at the bottom of my garden, which went up and down with the barrage being let up and down, and about eight miles of lovely lake water all the way up to Estaing itself. I had my own pontoon and well, you'll see for yourself. Let's go. Here we are in Aveyron in France, the south of France, about two thirds of the way down and halfway across. Although we come under the Midi Pyrenees, we're actually in the Massif Central, so we're fairly high up in the mountains here, although in a well sheltered little valley in the gorge of the Lot. 
This film is a record not just of the lovely things that have happened, but of all the hard work you've had to do here and all I've had to suffer as well. Well, there have been some wonderful times, there have also been some very hard ones. As you just saw by the information about my friend Sheila, I didn't intend coming here alone. She was a very good friend in England and decided to also buy property over here and I was going to stay with her a while, help her do her house whilst doing mine up and then move in the following spring. But unfortunately, as you see, she became ill and died before that could happen. So we had all this upset to deal with, plus having to find my way in France, not speaking the language and uh, so much work to have to do. I set up my caravan and started living in that at first, and for the first two weeks of the April that I arrived four years ago, it rained like a monsoon incessantly for three weeks. Everything became soaked, I was so cold and damp, but I managed to survive. I retired early through ill health, perhaps you might wonder why I made this choice. I'd looked at other properties in the UK, I'd looked in Portugal and I'd looked at Spain, and I felt that I could have stayed quite comfortably in my little cottage in Bridlington on the east coast of Yorkshire, but felt an adventure would be good. An adventure, by its own uh, name, has to be a risk. You cannot have an adventure without having some risk. So I took that and thought, if it all goes wrong, at least I can still return to England. Maybe not so easy now, with the prices of properties changing so much. But it's all been very worthwhile, I feel. The Paradu had been a bar, restaurant, cafe and dance hall before. And the right-hand smaller building, which was the cafe, I was going to convert into my house. And the larger hall I hoped to make into the chambres and the salon, the little private bar and my main gallery for my artwork. It turned out to be almost a total rebuild. Everything was in very, very poor condition. It was only the situation that was so good. Here you see the old fish pond which I converted into a small plunge pool. I then moved from the caravan into the main hall which was built of wooden panels all around the outside with large gaps in between the walls and it was extremely cold in winter, the wind blew through like a gale and I was huddled up on one little gas fire having to use three hot water bottles at night even to get into bed it was so cold. I used my packing cases to make a few internal walls and then made a little home from home. How many men can say they've actually had their bedroom built right next to their own bar? Whilst I waited for the planning permission to be completed, as I'd already waited a year before I came over, it gave me a chance to get on with planning the gardens, uh, renewing the pontoon, the wood on the pontoon which had to be hand cut, and painting, and start on all of the actual gardens and lawns themselves. A lot of work to do. Here you can see how high the river is and the amount of water I was getting at that time of year. Now I find that's quite normal. When you first start off here and you're living in a caravan and just uh, trying to make do, it's not easy. I had the use of one toilet. I had water and electricity, but that was about it. The old false septic, the old septic tank was going to have to be replaced. The estate agent that I brought the property through was also acting as my agent whilst I was away that first year and was supposed to be getting all the work done, finding builders and finding various uh, tradesmen to do all the work. Unfortunately, he overrated himself, was not very efficient and was not cost effective at all. In the end, I had to let him go and the builder took over the project with me and also became a close family friend. With him, we then completed the project. Speaking the language is certainly one of the biggest problems in moving abroad and when you're moving into a project like this you really do need to be able to speak the language or have a lot of assistance because there are so many people trying to rip you off. Okay, there are many very kind and very good people and tradesmen in any foreign country as in England but also over here there's always somebody trying to uh, take some money off you for nothing. As an example, I was misguided by the same agent to use a very expensive architect who wanted over £8,000 to do two sets of plans and get permission. The plans were so basic that they were just copies off mine and I had to complete better plans on the computer for my builder to use. Be very careful about these sorts of rip-offs. We started on what was the old kitchen and cafe, gutted the interior, took the whole roof off, treated all the timbers and then started to rebuild in there whilst I lived in the main hall. It was then that we managed to find many of the hidden problems we couldn't see before. It was only virtually a cow shed. One wall was so thin in the breeze block we had to replace a whole wall. And the end of the building needed underpinning as well. But once I got rid of that agent and was taking the advice of the builder, we were able to get the property finished to a much higher standard. We had very, very good insulation, which is very important here. And the building now, although modern, is quite delightful. 
Whilst all of this was going on, it meant we could start on the gardens. They also had to be totally renovated, they just turned into fields. Of course, there were grass and weeds everywhere, so the whole thing had to be replanned and started from scratch. There was plenty of time for this because over here in France you don't have one builder doing everything. The builder contracts in all the tradesmen. A plumber does one work, a woodworker does another work, the four septic man does another work. So they're all after extra cash here. And of course they can't all correlate together so you might be waiting two weeks, three weeks for another tradesman to turn up. Also uh, in the Mediterranean areas you'll find it's very much manana. You say something's going to be done in two days, it'll be four days, two weeks, four weeks, two months, four months, everything doubles, and unfortunately, so do their prices very often. Also, many of the laws and regulations are very different abroad. Beware of allowing builders to work you for cash, for instance, because if they do, in England, if, if you get found out, <coughs> it's the builder who has the problem. In France, it's you that gets put into prison and find a lot of money. Also, if the builder does this, and halfway through the job, he turns around and says, I want more money. What can you do about it? Almost nothing, because you don't say anything. If he stops and says, I'm going to double the price, you're in trouble. The local markets in this area were a little disappointing to me at first, because I expected lots of fresh-grown produce. What they do have, though, are wonderful plants for sale. Instead of just planting seeds here, you can buy whole bunches of half-grown plants to plant straight out in your garden. A much better idea, which should be a good idea in England, I would think, as well. Here you see I'm just getting the lawn sorted out, but that's all going to change later because it's going to turn into a huge building site when we dig all the four septic areas for the tubes to go in and so on. The first vegetable garden area had been sprayed and then we had to dig and rotivate completely and adding masses and masses of compost and peat after that to get the uh, poor soil up to standard. Here you see we had to replace most of the oak planks on the original pontoon. The existing pedalos that came with the place turned out to be a total waste of time. They were extremely heavy, were made of metal and were actually rusting away. So in the end I had to pay somebody to take away not only the old pedalos, but also much of the kitchen equipment which had been sold as usable with the place, but was actually total trash. Fortunately this wasn't a direction I wanted to go. My direction was to have the gallery make Chambaudot and not have a big public bar. It's a small private barn area for the uh, guests of the Chambres. As things turned out, another English lady made contact who wanted to also move to France and run a business. She took over the idea of running the boating and has now invested in more pedalos and barks for the fishermen and uh, for the tourists. We also managed to buy a much bigger boat to run trips up and down the river as well with up to six people. I decided I wanted a nice small porch at the front of the house at the entrance there and also a small herb garden to hold the gravel back. So I designed this and we used local slate for the roof of that. Another problem to be aware of when running a project like this is the many leeches that tend to come onto you. Because people need work locally, they'll seek out uh, work with the English thinking that they can provide you with lots of easy money. And also people who can't produce their own dreams want to share yours. That can be fine in a way. Unless, of course, they're just total time waiters, as I found with so many that came here, wanting to run the bar or do this or do that, and actually didn't really have the initiative or the nows to do it at all. I had no bathing facilities as yet, so although I could use a friend's at times, I had to make do with uh, such situations as this when we had a thunderstorm and I could go outside with my umbrella and shower under the nice warm uh, summer rain. Otherwise my only choice was to either strip wash or take the watering can and fill that with warm water and shower over the open French toilet in the old building. Not very pleasant. Once the roof was on the main building and work progressed, I was able to move into the kitchen put some plastic over the doors and uh, had my bed in the kitchen plus started to build inside the kitchen and sort things out. For my first Christmas I was invited to local French friends and I invited them back to this little cuisine and they shared an English Christmas dinner as well. After a few further glitches with various tradesmen who weren't doing the work properly or trying to rip us off, we eventually got the interior finished. Next you see the foundations for the new patio at the front of the house looking over the river going in and then the total mess that was made in putting all the four septique in. Finished the lawns off completely and had to start all over again.
The interior walls in this more modern house were going to be made of placa plata or plasterboard with lots of insulation. We did make sure that the house was extremely well insulated because in this area it's quite cold in winter. This is my little wood burning stove which was moved to the other side of the room later. Now although I have gas central heating, we don't use it so much because I get mainly supplied by lots of wood coming down in spring with the big storms here and the rain, which we then cut up to see us through the rest of the winter. We didn't use carpets in the house but used tiles or carolage throughout because the nature here is so strong which means lots and lots of insects. We don't want all these creepy crawlies constantly coming through and also we're always in the garden coming in and out so to tread all that muck through wouldn't be uh, good at all. This way we can clean the house quite easily. I guess we've finished up with the feeling of an English country cottage and also a French cottage as well. But let's go right back in the story. When I first arrived, the Paradou was just a field of dandelions, an empty hall, all this rubbish left about, and virtually a cow shed as a cafe. My eldest daughter, Julia, came to see me there, had this old rowing boat, and just potted about on the uh, water, and she enjoyed the old pedalos there as well. About another two miles further down the lake is the main barrage, or dam, and the whole lake is controlled by that daily. It would go up or down between the depths of about 10 to 15 feet. It was always controlled well, so it never flooded, or would never come above a certain level. As you see here, the white walls of the main hall were just sliding panels, so the wind would whip in between them, and it wasn't windproof at all. The old planks of the old pontoon that floated up and down needed replacing, so I had to go and buy oak planks from the local sawmills and cut those up myself, finish them myself and replace them. This was the old cafe on two levels and in fact it needed underpinning as well and that pile of rubbish you see at the end was hiding a large crack in the wall, deliberately hidden I feel. All of the old metal pedalos were on their last legs so I sold them all off except for one fibreglass one. The surrounding woodlands are fantastic, full of hazel trees, walnut trees and chestnuts and also were great for mushrooms as well and for most of the year, from even early summer right through into autumn, various types of mushrooms would, would come up, Girole and Pied de Mouton and all sorts of other ones. My nearest village, only 10 minutes up the road and a nice easy cycle ride as well, was a stang. I could reach that by boat, it was only 7 miles up the river. It had a large chateau, the Chateau de Stang, which in fact was purchased by Giscard de Stang whilst I was there. The French are lovers of ce celebrations and carnivals, and they had a wonderful firework display every autumn, or faux d'artifice. Quite a few of the villages did this. Also there were sonnet lumière around the chateau, music and sound and lights. The water was normally clear enough to swim in all through summer, but there were still some drains leaking in there that shouldn't have been. And here's that beautiful stone bridge over the river Lot at Astang. Now let's go further down the river back to La Paradou. As you see at this stage, La Paradou was absolutely wild and just a meadow. The gardens are completely gone, no flowers, anything. I planted some bulbs fairly early on. We had daffodils coming up around the place fairly quickly. But all of these lawns had to be mown down bit by bit. And then I also started to demarcate out areas for the vegetable gardens and use spray to burn off the grass in those areas. In the main hall there was a small water heater, a cooker and a toilet. But there was nothing working in the cafe area. There was a shower base but no shower. And I actually had to use a watering can or as you see an umbrella at one stage to shower there at first. Very, very basic. And then just wash in the sink um, during winter. It wasn't very pleasant and the first winter was very, very harsh on me. For the first months and immediate time I used my little caravan, my touring caravan to live in. But we had the worst weather of all, I think almost my entire time there, and two weeks of torrential rain. 
Every April, every year, the first few weeks of April would always be storms and torrential rain, which would wash down logs for the heating for later as well. So once we got used to the system and once we knew the seasons there, it worked very well. You can see here a log I've dragged up by the pontoon, which we can cut up later for logs. I would reckon on one large tree for a month of logs of usage in the parish. My house was actually built in a nature reserve, so I was very lucky to have that situation down below a village. Nobody could build around me, and it was full of wildlife. Of course, all the fish and the carp and so on in the river, but lots of wildfowl and birds, nightingales in the summer, and also deer and foxes and so on around, which would call at night, as would the owls. You must remember that a long time back, before the barrage, this was just a gorge, and later on you will see in this film how the gorge actually is further down, just a precipice of rocks and this rushing river that cascades down the bottom. With the barrage, that has filled up and given us this lovely tranquil lake. Unusual and expensive things such as this mistletoe here grows freely on the trees around me. This was the old cafe area that I turned into my main home. It was in two levels. First of all we stripped down the walls to see what they were like and found that one of the walls was almost falling over anyway. It was only built of thin breeze block. I bought a second hand washing machine and bits and pieces just to keep myself going, keep them running. And soon I'd stripped all of this out and taken the entire roof off because the roof had to be replaced as it was asbestos. And that was expensive too to remove all of that. I broke away the bridge over this old fish pond and turned it into a small waterfall on the left and turned that into my little uh, plunge pool. You can see the panels here on the inside of the building were just sliding panels which the wind would just blow through. But soon I moved into there put, using the boxes as walls to keep me relatively warm or to keep the drafts out a bit. But it was absolutely freezing, especially in winter. And it was a very hard first winter indeed. But it was still very satisfying to live in such a beautiful place and have such a wonderful adventure. The early mornings were tremendous. Beautiful sunrises, early mists coming up off the lake. It was absolutely beautiful. A few weeks after I moved there, my personal items arrived from the removals and all of these boxes were brought in and of course I had nowhere to put everything at the time except store it in the hall. So as I say, I used those boxes to turn them into walls, making myself a little home from home inside the dance hall. There were already plentiful tables and chairs existing from the previous cafe. I had my old English television and a DVD player so I could use my DVDs and so on and had plenty of music, plenty of my own CDs and stuff to play to keep me occupied in the meantime. My little 12 foot boat was also very useful. I had a little electric motor for that as well and purchased a car whilst I was over there, a left hand drive run fairly quickly. Here you see how the floods come very very fast there. When it does rain the lake fills up very quickly and I have one of the best fishing areas there is there because that's a large pool in front of my pontoon. And the current would eddy round in a big circle there and form a swirling gentle mass in the centre which the fish seem to like and they would breed there as well. So the big silure or the catfish and the zander and so on would all come down there and in spring would congregate there so the fishing was pretty tremendous. We didn't have close seasons in that part of the lake, so that was also quite fun to do. You see a swing in the background that became a favourite place of mine. I could sit there of an evening and just swing and listen to the nightingales as well. In the hall there was a bar area which was stacked full of glasses and all the old accoutrements that came with it. And I had my own private bar right next to my bed there that I'd set up there in the hall. Concrete floor, very cold, but a home from home nonetheless. Using the tables that I had there, I soon began unpacking my stuff and made little workshops in one corner and a lounge area in another and a little kitchen area in another and an eating area in another so that I could gradually begin to get work done and uh, use my tools as well. I bought this new box trailer which became an absolute godsend and I've actually brought it back to England with me and it's still running. A little box trailer that is just so so useful. Down by the river in one corner of the garden I built a bonfire and that was going fairly constantly at the beginning and all the ash and the mess would be washed away when it had burnt out by the rising and dropping of the tide of the river. The telephone line was already connected so I did have my computer running in the old hall and I also had access to the telephone to my family and so on. 
Here you see the cafe area being stripped out piece by piece. All the old lagging had to go, all the old bits of plasterboard and so on. Everything, all the rubbish had to be cleaned out completely to start again. I gradually began to establish the gardens, both the borders, vegetables and the flower gardens. I found these old rather nice earthenware bricks and the sods of earth had to be broken up one by one, the grass pulled away and the soil kept and then I used those um, bricks to put around the edges as borders. It had to be a long, slow and quite difficult process because with my health I can't do that much with my back and so on. So little bit by little bit, gradually, and I had some help from friends that came in. I soon made new friends there. There were a couple of English guys that liked to fish as well and wanted to make use of the place to enjoy themselves as well as help me out. Very soon the beds became more and more established and you can see now it becomes more formal. And I soon began planting up asparagus beds and all sorts of wonderful things into these. I found these old troughs that I put at one end and uh, the garden soon began to take shape. Planting always takes a long time to get established and I like a lot of perennials rather than just annuals. But we soon had these lovely little bright blooms cheering up the place I purchased a new tractor mower because there's no way that I can use a hand mower and walk around or push it around. The tractor mower was nice and easy to ride on and it began to bash down the long grass and began to make a very nice lawn indeed. Although this was to change later because so much work had to be done and I had to relay soil over the top. Here you see the start of the vegetable area, this coming on the left now, where I've killed all the grass off, peeled it away, and I get my big old rotavator in there. Again, it does most of the work for you, and dug it all over to make the new veg patch. The pontoon had to be made safe, so I say I cut my own boards from local planks of oak and covered those with a mixture of varnish and sand so that you could grip on that. In winter it was lethal, otherwise you'd just slip straight down. Once I cleaned this old fish pond out, I made an area to the right for a little waterfall and circulation pump, and at the other end had a statue. And then I had a special liner made for this. One of my fishing guests later was a good contact because he had especially made a stainless steel ladder for me to climb in and out of the pool. Here are some of those oak planks I bought and cut up to make the pontoon boards. And once spring had gone and summer comes towards us, the water changes and becomes far more tranquil. You see my little boat was there just now with its mast up. I did manage to sail it once or twice on there, although the winds were far and few between coming down the gorge. But quite fun to sail as the wind backs off the various parts and hills. I made my main entrance to my house, this far end of the cafe. Unfortunately, both leaves and gravel were constantly going into this existing drain, so I built a small double wall and turned that into a herb bed that went lengthways and a step down in between. Later on I was to build a porchway there as well that you'll see. The vegetable garden was now well cleared and rotivated and overlooked from the seat that went just behind the storage shed there lovely area just to sit and look across my gardens and down to the pontoon, as was the swing just below it where I could sit and swing of an evening and look down the whole lake. I planted several grapevines and by the time I'd left they were covering the whole front of the barn. We had beautiful black grapes and white grapes growing there. Here you see the herb beds ready to, to fill with soil. As I say, I'm in the centre of a nature reserve and the fields each side of me and meadows are beautiful and full of wild flowers. 
plenty of insects, wonderful butterflies and moths and so on, and of course lots of crickets. And when these are harvested, when these meadows are mown down in autumn, the crickets came across like a plague. And in my first year living in the uh, dance hall, they came through all the cracks and crevices when the meadows were mown. And at night it was like a horror film, they were crawling all over the place. Although I didn't do this very often, here you can see my little yacht with the sails set, a little spot of drifting about on the lake. So from what you've seen, the conditions are quite extreme. Very cold in winter, minus 13 degrees, but the long, very hot summers and wonderful wildlife. And because the summers were so hot and so long, I didn't need a greenhouse. I could grow tomatoes out of doors. I set up a chicken run not far from the house and dug the fence wire well into the ground, completely covered it because there were foxes about as well as buzzards. So I had plenty of fresh eggs soon and even got my incubator and got some local farm eggs and hatched my own chicks as well. My little electric motor was great because it took no fuel, no noise, no smell. I could just potter about in the boat quite quietly and drift for Xander and troll for Xander as well. In my main gardens I like to mix vegetables with flowers. It means that I keep the insects down that way track them away to the flowers. Some flowers even put some insects off, certain ones, others draw them to them. But my cabbage patch there amongst the flower garden worked very well. Here's the start of my strawberry bed, which was right next to the um, asparagus bed. Here's the main vegetable garden. Now this is the main front door being made, because I'd made this wonderful porch there, but I needed to have a stable door, so I built it as one and then chopped it in half and made a joint. The main front porch I built with a couple of 4x4s, four some external ply and then got some of the local beautifully rounded edge slates to go along the top of the roof to keep the water completely out with a layer of plastic in between. So there's my stable door and the new porch. To keep the mess out of the pool I just made some very simple screens of plastic and uh, pieces of 2x1. And I wanted to keep the door and the shutters on the buildings in that nice French blue. And here are the first herbs planted in my herb garden, just outside the front door, which is also the entrance of the kitchen.
As you see here, it's now reached midsummer, and the first year of the veg gardens are doing really well. We got some manure into them as well, but a huge pile of cow manure come along, and they're facing into the sun, which was a mistake. I had to actually face them at right angles to it rather than across the sun, as the sun was so hot it burnt the leaves. Something you learn. These big trees here are nearly all lime trees, which is actually wonderful because you can make a special tea out of them. The seeds at a certain time of year are ready to pick. They are extremely fragrant then, the flowers, and the whole place hums with bees. When the seeds have been dried, the flowers have been dried, then you can make a tea out of them, an infusion out of them. Then another adventurer came along, a chap called Mark, who was a carp okay, fisherman, and he'd now. moved there specifically for that yeah, on his own. He stayed with me for a while in the caravan and stayed at the place and helped out. He eventually bought his own small place, but kept coming to visit and joining us. He was just fooling around with a lad that was staying with us. Just now I talked about the flowers from the lime tree, the TL, and here I am picking some to dry later and use as an infusion or as a tea. My eldest daughter Julia came to visit again and used to enjoy my air rifle. Here she's just having a pot of a tin can down on the lawn. Well there we are, you can see the place has been licked into shape now and how well the vegetable garden's doing. As you've seen, what was the cafe were turning into my home, but in that old cafe was a huge old barbecue type um, burner. We took that outside and put it up on some blocks and it became my permanent barbecue. It was a big old beast, but it was great for these outdoor barbecues. And it wasn't long before I had made a mixture of local friends, both French and English. Marcel there, pictured, lived in a house just above me, in Carmarans in the village. Now had this wonderful old house where a real old artisan, or paysan of the region, George, used to live as well. This is the middle courtyard of his house, looking like something from Romeo and Juliet, these wonderful medieval buildings. Marcel was a great pal when I was there and very, very helpful. We shared many meals together, me cooking and he cooking, and him showing me the area, introduced me to the various mushrooms and things that I could and couldn't eat, and where to find the best things. With Marcel's special knife. <laughs> so, if you prefer some cheese, or... yeah. 
photos from a cage she was wearing. Them. What about you? you <laughs> Little things bags. for the dogs. Yeah, but your I bags. use them. So you can see uh, my cousin and the friends. All the, what what the what they did instead of work, they settled up <laughs> on this. <laughs> that. Uh, Now the green is very comfortable. Mm -hmm. Here are some of my own chicks that I hatched in the incubator whilst there. Plants and trees grew very quickly in that environment and my peach tree soon bore fruit. You had to watch out for a disease called cluster pesh, which you had to spray for, but otherwise my grapes and, and the um, fruit trees soon provided fruit. My contacts on the internet also provided new friends. Then I met Lisa, who lived over in the Cévennes, and drove across to meet her there, and she showed me many wonderful areas there on that side of the coast as well, right across to the Camargue. I'll share some of these areas and trips with you later in the film. You're out of focus. I should be on auto if you're on me. <laughs> Here are some of the big fungi called seps. Quite expensive to buy in the stalls, but most of the time we could find our own in the woodlands. Tucked out of the way up amongst the forest there, she introduced me to this old Roman fort. This is fly agaric, the magic mushroom that you should not eat. That's a nice shot, look. During all of this time, of course, I wasn't only filming and photographing, I was continuing my artistic works, and Lisa was very kind to post me a couple of times. She had this wonderful house in a small village up there in the hills, and actually posed for me standing there going into the bathroom, which was rather nice. She also had a delightful small holding just down below the village on some terrace land. There was a great sense of freedom there in France. We would often bathe naked up in the mountain rivers and streams and also on some of the beaches down on the coast here at the Camargues. It was great to have the sun and the wind on your body. It was so warm. Well, summer gradually came to a close and autumn fruits were soon there in the basket. We have the figs, we have the grapes and of course all the vegetables from the garden. And as the autumn closed down, we get many more of the nuts as well. The hazelnuts, the walnuts and the chestnuts. Bags and bags and bags of them free to pick up.
My first year there I feel the garden was going very well. I think you'll agree with me. Those balmy summer moonlit nights with the crickets singing and the owls hooting, warm and nightingales in the background. Not only was the countryside very beautiful all around here and very diverse, especially around the gorge, but there were so many absolutely fantastic medieval villages with their oak beams, arches and stonework and these delightful roofs of curved ended slates, the blue slate. The roof was now on my new kitchen and I started using the base of an old uh, dresser building up my own shelves and my own dresser right the way around. You can see the pine door from the inside there now. Winter was coming on again and I was only partially finished but I could actually move into the kitchen and for a while I had my bed in the kitchen as I finished the kitchen but I was out of the hall at least. I'd had tremendous problems with the agent that had purchased the house and was ripping me off for money whilst I wasn't there and was trying to do so even when I was there. He wasn't efficient, he wasn't getting the builders done correctly, he wasn't correlating things. And fortunately I met another local builder, Jean Roger Colliers, who was a bit of a lad, but he took me under his wing, into his family, I could bathe there, they gave, they gave me food occasionally, and he got the building really going well. I'm afraid the agent didn't like him, but when it came to a choice of who was to stay, the agent had to go. Here you see the new roof on the cafe area, my home and also Jeanne beginning to build the terrace at the front and the extension out. We had a nice big double glazed patio window there looking out across the river. We were to build a whole patio at the front of that. A lot of the building there was done with placo platra or plasterboard. They put a metal framework up, insulate in between and then put the plasterboard over the top, screwed on. Using some of the old telegraph poles that were left behind, I made this rose arbour. I also used the poles for the chicken run. Insulation was the main thing. As you can see here, it did get extremely cold in winter. I did have a huge gas tank put in and I did have huge radiators for gas, but we mainly used the wood. With my log burner there and trees coming out every spring, I had plenty of wood free to last me all year. Then my dad did a bit of shooting as well, and he brought me this cock pheasant and a couple of hen birds that went in with my chickens. Eventually he managed to escape, but for a while it was nice having him crowing in the early mornings, especially in spring.
There were some beautiful walks which were easy for me to get to, either alongside the river or just up to the local chapel, the Chapel du Duel. We'll go into that in more detail later, a very romantic story. Just now I said how I moved into the kitchen and here we are, my first Christmas there, where we simply put a curtain across the opening out to the open lounge and air outside just to keep the warmth in for the, for the minute. And I held my first Christmas meals there, not only for my family, but also had Jan Roger around as well. The small lounge was a bit dark so I put in this electric Velux window which gave that additional light and fresh air in the summer when we required it. Now we started taking out the panels in the hall and putting complete walls in breeze block right the way around. He then started the new patio area and of course we had a forced septic or a septic tank to put in which was quite a major event as well and completely ruined all of the lawns I'd just done. But using the soil from that and extra soil brought in and my family coming to help me because I couldn't do it on my own that's for sure, we levelled out the soil to level out all the hilly parts of the lawns and have a nice gentle slope down. Uh, we see the bedroom being built into the um, new lounge area. That uh, wood burner was then moved to the other side of the lounge later on. That was just temporary. As you see the construction was very straightforward. We just used the metal framework and the placo platra, the plasterboard, screwed onto it. So I had now moved from my caravan out into the hall and then from the hall into the kitchen and now we're actually getting the uh, main house livable. Here's the main house from the road above. You can see how it's on the bend of the river which widens out, an ideal point for the fishing. The new patio base was now built, but I wanted a double wall putting up on the outside, in which I could grow tomato plants and so on. Here my daughter is doing a bit of artwork in the garden overlooking the lake. Up in the mountains is the village of Lagiole, where they make the famous Lagiole knives. Beautiful things. That Christmas, Jean Roger presented me one with my initials carved into it. A fine gift.
So now we're into our second year and I made a homemade solar panel just by using some Perspex, painting some of the roofing black and putting copper tubing around. Small heat pump and uh, I was circulating warm water around the pool. The main bungalow was now finished, the bedroom done, the bathroom done and uh, I started fitting shelving up, putting all my books and CDs and my collections of things around the house. It became far more finished, we had the carrelage or tiling for the floors which was far easier to keep in a country place like that, keeping the insects away and easy to clean. A lovely big bathroom with the view up to the hills and the river beyond, a nice big bath and a walk-in shower at the far end. Second-hand furniture is easily uh, purchased from a wonderful second-hand shop called Emaus, though in nearly every city. We built our own kitchen units, just brought the tops and the fronts and then made a framework inside and shelved them. I'd built up a collection of antique silver and crockery and so on over the years which I'd had stored away so it was so lovely now to have a place to have all of these. You see there my homemade wine rack by using drainage pipes. The way I live isn't really for a woman, I tend to have clutter all over the place and it gets very dusty and mucky which ladies don't like but it's the way I like to be. Now you see how well the fruit trees are doing and how I mix the flowers with the vegetables in most of the gardens. One morning I looked out and couldn't believe my eyes, I thought there was a giant rat, but this turned out to be a koi pew. there were a family of them living just round the corner. I would have liked to have had a window in this side of the kitchen looking out over the meadow, but I wasn't allowed to do this, so I put a vast mirror there, which reflected the window behind and gave me light in the kitchen in daytime. The house was very well insulated and very warm with all double glazing was not only inviting to both people and insects, but also the occasional visitor that was a little more unusual, such as this bat. Now work in the hall started in earnest. We divided up what was the wooden dance hall floor into the gallery area. The left hand side of the hall which was the bar became not only bar and dining area but also the um, studio area and the right hand side it became four double chambres. I also had a very useful storage room there for all my art stuff and paperwork. Then the double wall I wanted on the patio was built and I could start growing my tomatoes at last and green peppers. I transplanted some of the existing roses from the far side of the garden and retrained them up into the arbour. By then I totally renovated the pontoon and also painted, repainted it green and made it safe.
It was such a spiritual and peaceful place, in lovely little corners to sit there overlooking the rivers at different times of the day and night. I employed this company to come and remove some branches and fit um, some satellite dishes for me. They nearly killed themselves, they were absolute idiots, and sawed the branch that they were actually on, which then crashed down onto the ladder and tried to make excuses about the ladder already having been bent. Luckily I found a much better tradesman later. These were English, not French. I had two satellite dishes fitted so that I could get all the programs I wanted on Freeview from abroad. By now you see the gardens really well established, both flowers and vegetables, and all we needed to do was get all the concrete walls coated with a special coating of cream, cream grey, to make them look more presentable. Just look at the difference now in all of these flower beds and the rose arbour. In a matter of a couple of years, it's amazing what one can establish. This bird table was very, very useful. The amount of birds that I would get came in almost like piranhas on the thing. We had hundreds and hundreds of blue tits and all sorts of wonderful varieties coming in right through winter. I think we must have saved hundreds of birds' lives in those harsh conditions by keeping the food going all the time. And there we are, no need for a greenhouse. The smart is doing ever so well out of doors. Well, there we are, nearly at the end of the first hour of film. One hour for each of the eight years I was there. In the meantime, I could pop back some fours to England to see my daughters and family. And it, the trip from Rodez Airport was very easy to Stansted. By then, I'd be living on my own for 12 years anyway. Not only do I like fishing, but I also like to do a bit of hunting. The trouble is that I can't walk very far or stand too long. So Jan Roger very kindly invited me along, and with his skills, we got one or two good shots. But the way of shooting over there and the gun dog training was quite different to over here. His dog was absolutely mad. He left that bit of sausage and some bits and pieces on top of the car there, turned his head for a moment. Not only had the sausage on gone, but also the plastic bag it was in. Sure, the dog pooed the whole lot out later. And finally, at the end of this part of the film, we move on to the next part and link in with how we work with the community, how we linked in with the local schools and local children. 